I'm going to preach the most difficult message I have ever preached at church in the last 20 years. But I believe it's one of the most important messages that we need to preach in church today. It's most controversial topic politically and online. And it's the topic of abortion. Now, ever since my son was born, things changed for me and how I view babies. That's him in the womb. Let's bring the other one on the earth. Yeah. The same guy. I remember first time hearing an ultrasound. No wonder they said that once a person considering an abortion has an ultrasound, things just change. There's something just changes. I remember um, seeing images um, of him being already um, in the womb and then, you know, having him born and, you know, watching, caring for him for the last 32 days, which has been a great morning joy of my life. Before presenting this message, I also wanted our church not just to be known for what we are against, but what we're for. As a church, we support Hope Medical Clinic, which is a local faith-based, nonprofit community medical clinic providing compassionate, evidence-based healthcare services. Out of God's love for His creation, they educate and empower people to make informed decisions which enable each person to embrace health and life. They provide free lab-grade pregnancy test and nurse consultation, ultrasound at no charge to determine the gestation and availability of the pregnancy. So at church, we believe in babies. We want to have a lot of them. We want to be intentional that our children are raised up in the teachings of God. We want to have programs and we want to have ministries that are financed really well and, and really have good leadership there to help our children grow in the things of God. We want to go into schools to impact the children. Now if you're not a believer here today and you're visiting us today, I would like to give you also why we as Christians stand for life. If you are a believer and you just simply been those people who are like, yeah, I'm against abortion, I'm for pro-life, I will give you a biblical, also some common sense understanding why Christians and to them this matters so much. For President Joe Biden, the issue of abortion is the central issue of his campaign strategy. Donald Trump, who helped to elect three Supreme Justices that helped to overthrow Roe versus Wade, has shifted his position Yes, let's give the Lord a clap offering for the overthrowing of the Roe versus Wade. And it's not just us to celebrate, a lot of babies celebrate too. But Donald Trump changed his position lately to whatever helps him to get elected. So it's a political issue in the area of politics. And maybe some of you will say, well Vlad, you shouldn't be talking about this because it's a political issue. For a baby, for my son, life is not a political issue. It's life or death. And so it's not a political issue. It's a theological issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's not about church is trying to get into politics. It's that politics became religious. Before politics used to protect our rights and our property. Today they decide who is a man, who is a woman. Today, they begin to infringe on defining marriage. They used to just pave roads. Today, they open doors to male bathrooms or female bathrooms by opposite sex. Politics have become more religious than before. It's not that the church became more political. It's that politics became more spiritual. And so my desire today isn't trying to appeal political, but to bring the conviction from God's Word. We must understand, as a Christian, as a believer in God, someone who believes that I was made in the image of God, who has God, the way you view God determines how and what you value. For example, if you you view there is a God, it determines how you value another human being who carries the image of God. Also, if you believe there is a God, it enforces values set by God that marriage is sacred, sex 
is for the purpose of pleasure, procreation, protection, comfort, intimacy and it's supposed to be within marriage. Now we live in a generation today that's described in Judges and there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their eyes. When you reject God as your king, you don't have a proper view of God, you become a God to yourself. Your carnal nature, debased mind becomes the one that instructs your values and your view of humanity is no longer based on God but on convenience. So if it's something is convenient, that enforces your values. And so as a Christian, my value system doesn't come from my moral compass. It comes from the divine origin and He imposes that on me. When a culture rejects God as His supreme Father, the Creator, what that culture is left with now, because when you reject God as the source of truth, the place of God never remains vacant. That place is quickly occupied with something or someone else. Except whoever takes the place of God is never as nice, as kind, sacrificial and loving and forgiving as God. It's not as omnipotent, omniscient um, and omnipresent as God. And whoever takes the place of God will demand certain things. May I submit to you, our culture has a God. This God is sex. And this God demands a sacrifice. The sacrifice of a fetus. Satanism is not worship of Satan. It's a worship of self. The book of Satan has this thing that says the do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Meaning do what you want is the summary of what it means to be a part of a church of Satan. People think that the church of Satan, the temple of Satan is about worshiping the devil. Actually no, it's about worshiping yourself. The devil didn't become the devil because he worshiped the devil. The devil became the devil because he worshiped himself who was the devil. What begins to happen is that when you reject God, you become your little mini God. With that comes power becomes God, sex becomes God, greed becomes God. And these gods, they're mean, they're nasty, they're not loving and they're not kind. And they demand a sacrifice. I'll prove it to you. Pagan cultures always sacrifice children because gods demand a sacrifice. Ancient gods like Molech and Baal were associated with the sacrifice of human beings, particularly the sacrifice of children. Abortion is not a new thing. The idea of attacking innocent little children and offering them to a god is not new. It's been around the world for a long time ever since men rejected the dominion of God. Even God's people like Solomon offered babies to Molech. How could someone being a wise king build an altar to Molech? That's why I see Christians today and some of you will have a problem with me today because I will step on your woke progressive Christianity. Because we worship God but we think like the world. The Bible says, offer your body as a living sacrifice. And then it says this, do not be conformed to the ways of this culture, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Christianity is not just about coming to feel God. You got to think like Him. And that's why what we do is that we embrace the salvation, but we don't embrace the truth that comes with salvation that changes the way we think. Early Christian apologist Marcus Minusis, he said this, So they commit murder before they bring forth, and these things surely come down from the teachings of their God. So 2,000 years ago, Christian apologist said these pagan cultures bring children to their gods before they're born because that's what their gods demand. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn in his book, the return of the gods. He mentions three main gods of the Old Testament that 
had different roles and how these gods are influencing American culture. The first one is Baal and Baal was the one that really would replace the God of Israel and become the source of truth and uh, Rabbi Jonathan would say that Baal promises freedom for those who depart from God. After him comes Ishtar and Ishtar is the sex god. She would offer instant gratification and fulfillment for those abandoning moral safeguards. And after Ishtar comes Molech. Molech promises to grant blessings of unhindered life if we only feed our children to him on the altar. Ancient Molech sacrifice is no different than modern abortion. Let me give you the comparison. Ancient practice, parents would sacrifice their children, often involving priests in killing. Now, if that sounds barbaric, we are legalized. We have legalized that in the United States. In modern practice, physicians perform abortions. Ancient methods, children were pierced, cut, crushed, left to die, or burned. Modern, similar methods are used. Children are pierced, cut, torn apart, or chemically burned. In ancient times, wealthy brought children from the poor for the sacrifices, disproportionately affecting the poor. Some of you don't know this, but higher abortion rates among the poor and black communities, drawing the parallels to ancient discriminatory practices. Ancient justification, how could you justify killing children? Sacrifices were made for societal benefits, believed that it will gain favor with the gods. Abortions are seen as benefiting the society by enabling women to pursue their careers and clinics profit from selling fatal tissues. Ancient views were that child sacrifice was not only legal, it's holy. Modern view is abortion is legal, often defended as a sacred right, likened to ancient priests. Modern abortion providers benefiting corporations and political leaders are seen as ensuring continuous practice. This is what a, what a Greek writer said about people offering sacrifices to gods. Out of reverence for Kronos, Phoenicians, when they would seek to obtain great favor, vow one of their children, burning it as a sacrifice to the deity, if they were especially eager to gain success. Make no mistake, maybe you're not in that category today, but people, abortion is viewed as three different ways. It's a ritual, sacred ritual. It's a right, meaning my body, my choice, or it's, it's a sin. Our culture today views it, some extreme cases where it's a sacred right, people will die for it. And others view it as, it's a choice, or I will never do it, but we should never impose our morality on other people. Jeanette Paris, who is a psychologist, therapist, and author of many books, she's a retired professor at Polit Pacifica Graduate Institute and an author of the book called The Sacrament of Abortion. She likens abortion to a sacred act, a sacrifice to Artemides. She says this in her book, our culture needs new rituals as well as the laws to restore abortion to its sacred dimension. Abortion is a sacrifice, she said. It's a sacred act. She says it's not immoral to choose abortion. It's simply another kind of morality, a pagan one. Sarah Terzo said abortion is a major blessing. It's a sacrament in the hands of the women. Now, you know who else sees abortion as a sacred ritual? The members of Satanic Temple. The Satanic Temple, on behalf of its members, objects government interference with abortion access and contests that the laws that impede our faith in bodily autonomy and our ability to perform, this is what they call abortion, our religious abortion ritual. See, abortion for the church of Satan, the temple of Satan, is a sacred ritual. You know how we have the Holy Communion? That is what it's likened to. So instead of us trusting in His blood for our atonement, we offer the blood of our children to appease who? Ourselves. The God, the dark God of Molech. There was a king in the Bible, his name was Josiah. He led a nation back to God. 
And one of the first things he had to do is destroy the altars of Molech. If a nation returns back to God, its values will change. It will no longer value destruction of weak and vulnerable, but it will defend the weak, the poor and the vulnerable. When a nation returns back to God, now our goal today isn't to turn our nation to God. My goal here is to turn your heart toward God. And my desire is not just to turn your heart toward God, especially if you're a young person and you recently gave your life to Jesus and this topic triggers you already. I know that in this room, size of this room in Second Sanctuary, there are people who've committed abortions. And this topic just brings up memories and maybe brings guilt and condemnation. That is not the point of me preaching this message. My goal isn't to bring guilt and condemnation. Those of us who got saved, our past life is over. But we can't think on the level of our past life. We got to think on the level of God's truth, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us. 25% of global population lives in countries restricted to abortion services. Abortion is legal in most of the parts of North America, Europe, Asia and Australia, but it's illegal in Africa and South America mostly. Soviet Union was the first modern state to legalize on-demand abortions under Vladimir Putin. I should kind of tell you right away that this is not a good thing. In the 20th century, China enforced involuntary abortions to control their population. On January 22, 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court Roe v. Wade decision recognized constitutional protection for women's right to choose abortion under the right to privacy. When Donald Trump became the president because he elected three Supreme Court justices, they eventually on June 24, 2022, overturned Roe v. Wade. According to Planned Parenthood, abortion is a medical procedure that ends a pregnancy. But biblically speaking, abortion is more like an act of violence that kills the smallest and the weakest innocent human being. Now, for a Christian, number two, life begins at conception, not at convenience. To call abortion a health care is like calling slavery and employment. It's not right. Now people will say, when it comes to the issue of abortion, everything hinges on one, this one thing. When does someone become a person? Because people who advocate for pro-choice or pro-abortion would say that, you know, it's not really a person. They become a person and nobody really knows when someone becomes a person. Science actually cannot answer that because that's not a scientific question. That's a philosophical and that's a theological question. That's why we don't look to science to determine when you become a person. Now, one of the arguments is you become a person when you come out of the mother's womb. So anything that you were there in the mother's womb was not a person. Or when you take your first breath is when you become a person. And some people will actually use the Bible and say, because the Bible says that God breathed his breath into Adam and Adam became a living soul. So you're not a living soul until you take your first breath. The problem with that is that the, the creation of Adam was not the birth of Adam. Adam didn't have a mother. And Adam didn't have a belly button. I think. <laughs> Adam's creation shows how the humanity started. It does not show how humanity continues. Because none of us are born the same way Adam was created. Right? So Adam's creation cannot be used to advocate that that's when the personhood began because Adam didn't, was not an embryo. He was not a fetus. He didn't have a birth and Adam didn't have a childhood. So you cannot advocate Adam's creation as a sign that that's when you become a person. In fact, a child can breathe through the, um, through the umbilical cord in the mother's womb. The, the child has a heartbeat. The child already has its own DNA. The child has its already distinctiveness in it. Our Sammy was burping for a long time in my wife's womb and we could feel it. So to argue that you become a person when you are born 
is deeply flawed. What about the ones that are born prematurely? Are they persons or can we execute them until they are 40 weeks or 39 weeks old? And I'm gonna just throw in a few things. A fetus is a person with potential, not a potential person. Calling an unborn child a clump of cells is technically accurate but inadequate because this description can apply to every human adult being. We're all a bunch of cells. The main difference between an unborn and a newborn child are location, size, dependency level and development stage. Newborns still growing and highly dependent are no more valuable than when they were in the womb. Embryology shows us that from conception forward, embryos are living human beings. At fertilization, a child's DNA and traits like gender and appearance are set. It just needs nine months in the uterus to develop into a fully functioning human. So we don't become human beings when we're born. We are human beings, even in the womb. Our functions grow, our weight grows, our abilities, we begin to unlock them more and more. But even when a child is born, leave it by itself, it will die. It needs to be cared, it needs to be changed. It can't do anything by itself. And so to argue for this position that it's not a person, it's just a clump of cells is inaccurate. It could have been maybe accurate hundreds of years ago when we didn't know what was happening in the womb. It could have been accurate if the Bible wasn't explicit about the life of a person inside of the womb, which we're going to get to in the moment. A fetus is not an organ of a woman's body, such as liver. It's an actual person. My body, my choice. A hundred percent. I agree. But it's somebody else's body and it's their choice. Babies never chose death. Somebody chose that for them. A fetus is an individual attached to its mother only at a placenta. Being inside of something is not the same as being a part of something. Everyone's inside of the building. You are not a building. When we demolish the building, we don't demolish you with it just because you're here. You can't justify killing an uninvited yet harmless house guest or an unwanted person in your body. As a visitor in the womb, an unborn child deserves hospitality, not death. No single, the one single choice to commit an abortion robs a baby of a lifetime of choices. Babies never choose to die. And people who fight for my choice, my choice, respectfully. Where was your choice to prevent the pregnancy in the first place? Why did you fail to exercise your choice knowing sex leads to pregnancy? And now punishing someone who will never be able to make any choices because of one choice that you made. It's not fair. It's not right. And it's not moral. Uncertainty about the status of the fetus justifies caution, not abortion. Let's just say that you're here and you say, Vlad, I don't agree with you still. All of these are just good statements. You're emotionally manipulating people. I don't agree with that. Let's just say that we don't know when a person is a person. Embryo state or a fetus state. Let me give you an example. Let's say you go hunting with your son. You go into the woods, both of you separate, he takes a different position, you take a different position. And you notice that position, the direction he went to, there's some movement there and you're not certain if it's a deer or if it's your son. Uncertainty whether it's an animal or a person, does that warrant pulling the trigger or does that warrant caution? No one in the right mind We'll say, we'll get trigger happy. No, you would rather miss a deer just so that you don't execute your son. So if you're not certain, even though there's so much signs pointing to the fact that every person starts as 
an embryo as a fetus and it's not a person that goes into different phases and becomes a person it's the same thing that you pull out from the womb and you start seeing it's the same person same one nothing has changed just the location that's all if you're not certain that warrants caution not yelling to advocate death We seek to alleviate suffering, not eliminate sufferers. But it's better to kill this fetus because what if it's going to be born with a deformity? You see the interest rates, you see how hard life is. I'm going to remove this fetus to save it from all the misery. Now if you're not a believer, I understand your reasoning. If you're a Christian, that reasoning not only is deeply flawed, it's anti-biblical. The Bible doesn't give us right to eliminate sufferers. If that argument is true, let's prevent this baby, this fetus from ever encountering suffering. What if we use that line of reasoning to go and wipe out hospitals today? What if we take all the elderly people with Alzheimer's, people on breathing machines, all the children that are deformed, people with Down syndrome and say, you know what, let's just alleviate their suffering by getting rid of them. That would be immoral. Not only that would be ungodly, that would be anti-human. Nobody would do that. Yet that line of reasoning is applied to the most defenseless, defenseless, weakest member of our society. What we do as Christians is we help those that suffer. We create medicine. We find ways. We find methods to make their lives easier. This world is hard. It's not easy. But God gives us His grace to help the sufferers, not exterminate them. Abby Johnson, from a Christian family, a pro-life, signs up to volunteer at Planned Parenthood, thinking that the goal of the Planned Parenthood is to prevent pregnancy. She's a Christian. From a Christian background, she starts to work from Planned Parenthood and eventually becomes their director. There's a movie that came out on that. She then starts selling birth control, pitching ideas about abortion to young girls. And director shows her dead baby body parts. She's not upset. She gets pregnant, takes the pill, terminates the pregnancy. There's a part in the movie where a baby is, it happens during abortion where the doctor is going inside of the womb with a vacuumer to gently, that's what Planned Parenthood says, uh, remove the baby. Pretty much it's going in to vacuum the baby out and turn it into just a, a liquid blood. And this AB, she sees this on the screen when the baby in the womb is clinching and fighting away and trying to get away from the metal pieces that the doctor is trying to put into its womb. Because the baby wants to live, not die. And that encounter changed this woman's life. And she went from being a director at Planned Parenthood. You see the baby fighting, trying to get away from death. Because babies don't choose to die. They want to live. And so I want to encourage you today not to advocate, think or vote for people on Molex payroll. This is what she says, suddenly the reality of this baby who's trying to avoid doctor's painful tools becomes clear to me. And now of course she gets in trouble with Planned Parenthood, eventually lawsuits and everything begins. Now I understand when Roe versus Wade got overturned, local news media was in the front of our church and they right away asked me a question. So you stand for pro-life? I said, yes I am. What about those who get abused? No. What about those who are conceived in rape, in abuse? And that's, people love to use that argument. First of all, the chances or those cases are so rare, but they still happen. This is what I want to say. The guilty party should be punished for a crime, not an innocent unborn child. 
in Deuteronomy it says fathers shall not be put to death for their children nor shall children be put to death for their fathers a person shall be put to death for his own sin to argue as tragic as barbaric as painful the circumstances of somebody's conception is it does not warrant their termination because of how they were conceived circumstances surrounding your birth don't change the fact that you are a human being Roland Warren argued that abortion arguments resemble those for slavery in slavery they said your birth determines your worth supporters of abortion and slavery both subscribe to the notion that how you came into being determines whether one should be considered a human being in the legal sense in other words the circumstances of your birth determine your worth that was the argument used for slavery and that is still being used today for abortion your circumstances how you were conceived determine whether you deserve to live the second argument for slavery that's used for abortion is people are property slaves in the south the unborn child is treated not as a separate and distinct human life but rather as a property of the mother that can be killed with no legal consequences that's exactly what they did during slavery a slave is my property i can do whatever i want with it same reasoning is applied to a fetus it's my property i can do whatever i want with it and i deserve to have a right for that the third one is bodies are for sale with slavery and abortion there is a dehumanization and karma commercialization of vulnerable people in other words the notion that slaves and the unborn have intrinsic intrinsic value is rejected and they have instead been subscribed as commercial value or economic cost and the last one is vulnerable are worth sacrificing if you think slavery is illegal you have the same basis to argue abortion should be as well just because abortion is legal, it does not make it right. Slavery, segregation, and Holocaust were all legal. It did not make them right. Now I understand maybe some of you will say, but Vlad, I'm pro-life personally. I'm just pro-abortion politically. It's like this. I'm personally against abortion, but I don't think it should be illegal. Women should have the right to choose, though I could never have the abortion myself. I know abortion is wrong, but the government should never leg legislate morality. We shouldn't force our religious beliefs on other people. Now let's apply the same thing to slavery. I'm personally against slavery. I don't think it should be illegal. I think people should have a decision whether they want to have slaves or not, but I'll never have slaves. I'm against that. Slavery is wrong, but the government shouldn't tell us what to do. We shouldn't force our religious beliefs on other people who want to have slaves. Slavery is wrong because it's another human being that is being subjected and treated like a property of another. And abortion is wrong on the same moral platform. Actually, it's even worse because with slavery you're dealing with adults, with abortion you're dealing with children. With slavery you're not killing them, you're torturing them. With slavery you're exterminating them. What does the Bible say? The last thing. The Bible tells us that life begins at conception. And I'm going to go quickly through this. God is pro-life. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Every person who read, Jews who read that verse, they knew what that meant. Have sex and make babies. Be married, make babies. God's people were pro-life. When Pharaoh wanted to kill babies, the Bible says midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved male children alive. They were saving children, not helping the culture throw them into the Nile. The unborn have legal rights. 
in Exodus 21 it says when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman that her child comes out prematurely but there is no harm the one who hit her shall be fine as the woman's husband shall impose on him and he shall pay as the judge is determined but if there is harm meaning if the child dies you shall pay life for life God forms us in the womb Psalm 100 verse 3 it says know that the Lord he is God it is he who made us not we ourselves we are his people and the sheep of his pasture and Job 31 15 it says did he not made me in the womb did not the same one fashion us in the womb so what's happening there when that embryo becomes a fetus there's a fashioning that clump of cells become legs and start kicking and start breathing and start sucking and start hitting God says in his word he fashions every child even non-canonical literature on Jewish wisdom demonstrates first centuries Judaism view on abortion I'll mention one more is God knows us in the womb Psalm 139 16 your eyes have saw my substance being yet unformed see David is talking about himself he didn't say somebody else was in the womb he says my I was there not yet formed he's now referring to an it he's talking about himself as an embryo he's talking about himself as a fetus he says I was not yet formed but that was me there and in your book all my days were written the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them Jeremiah 1 5 God calls us from the womb before I formed you in the womb I knew you before you were born I sanctified you I ordained you as a prophet to the nations even book of Enoch declares that an angel evil angel taught humans how to smash the embryo in the womb the first century Jewish historian Josephus wrote that the law orders all the offspring to be brought up and forbids women neither to cause abortion or to make away with the fetus. That is Jewish authors that are not even in the Bible talking about that the biblical worldview embraces life, children, not death. What about the New Testament? Children can worship in the womb. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the baby, that the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 141. Luke 143, it says, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now I want you to watch this. First, the Greek word for the baby here is not only used for the unborn baby in Luke 141, 144. But it's also used for a newborn when the angel announced the birth of Jesus in Luke 2 12 and Luke 2 16. And the same word is used for children in Luke 18 verse 15. So the same Greek word that's used for the fetus is used for now the baby that's born and the angel tells the shepherds go and see the baby and then it's used for the children the parents bring to Jesus to bless them so the Bible uses the same word for the fetus for the newborn and for children interestingly Elizabeth's baby leaped in her womb when Mary and her baby arrived in her house Mary is called the mother of Jesus when she was pregnant not when she gave birth. That's the Bible. Elizabeth honored Mary's baby and didn't call him a fetus, called him my Lord. Meaning it's a person. That's the New Testament. And both women's unborn babies were living human beings. They were not choices. Like do I choose a salad or a burger? They were children already. The Greek word calls them children. The Bible uses this ideology that they are persons. Early Christians in Didache or Didache 2.2 commends that thou shall not murder a child but abortion or kill them when born. A letter of Barnabas said you shall not abort a child nor again commit an abortion. 
Early Christians provided alternatives by rescuing and adopting children when they were abandoned. For instance, there was this guy who provided a refuge for abandoned children by placing them in Christian homes. Another guy would offer nourishment and protection to abandoned children, including some with disabilities caused by unsuccessful abortions. I hope that this becomes clear today for us. That God is pro-life. The alternative is not pro-choice. It's pro-death. It's not right terminology. We got to call it for what it is. And I appreciate, I disagree with the liberal uh, comedian, but I appreciate his level of honesty on that. Now, in the conclusion, do you remember what I mentioned about Roe versus Wade? The law that became, made abortion legal. Let me tell you about this lady, Jane Roe. She got pregnant and claimed she was raped. Later on, she said that was not true actually. Wanted to get an abortion, Texas law prohibited all abortions except to save mother's life. Norma thought it violated her rights. She filed a lawsuit for violating her rights. It went all the way to Supreme Court. 14th Amendment, which protects person's right to privacy, was extended to woman's womb, allowing her the right to end her pregnancy. Thus, Roe versus Wade was made. Now, interestingly, she later said she was never raped. She didn't become pregnant because of a sexual assault. So the whole law to slaughter millions of babies was based on a lie. She did come from a very rough neighborhood and family background. She was a victim of abuse, but it had nothing to do with her pregnancy situation. Actually, she never got an abortion because by the time it became a national law, she already gave birth to a child in Texas. Most of her life, she, exist, she existed on the edge of financial problems, dealt with alcohol and drug addictions. She eventually settled down with her same-sex partner, Connie, and that relationship lasted 35 years. Until she moved to a neighborhood and her neighbor was a pastor. A pro-life pastor and operation rescue leader, Flip, moved into the house next door. They reached out to her, they started to pray for her and they led her to the Lord. She got saved, she got baptized. And one of the most significant changes in her life was her genuine movement from pro-choice to pro-life. This is what she said, I was convinced that what I was doing was the right thing, but I was deceived. I deeply regret the role that I played in legalization of abortion. I've come to realize that life begins at conception and that abortion ends a human life. If you don't believe me, believe someone who put the law of abortion in motion. If you are here and you've committed abortion and you're coming here today to church and I want to give you a verse and I want to tell you that Jesus Christ forgives saves, restores, and redeems every sin. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The power of Jesus, He died for your sin. Whatever that sin is, whether you were deceived by the culture, whether you were embarrassed by the pregnancy that happened, whatever it is, it doesn't justify that it is sin. But it also doesn't change the fact there is a place for sinners like you and a sinner like me. It's at the feet of the cross. When we come, we experience forgiveness, we experience redemption, and we move away from the cultural perception and view, and we move to the crisis view. We love life. We love marriage. The sex is within marriage for the purpose of pleasure, procreation, comfort, and intimacy and protection. And we raise our families and train them in the things of God.